how to get rid of unhealthy cravings and habits. Excessive eating, biting our fingernails, or spending an extraordinary amount of time on social media. The ancient Stoics would warn us against spending too much time on empty pursuits if they do not bring lasting satisfaction or fulfillment. Therefore, we should analyze our habits and desires in the context of our overall life satisfaction. The next four steps will help us to better break bad habits. Step 1. Evaluate the consequences of your habits. The main goal of this first step is to determine the habits and cravings and what their consequences are, so that we can begin to analyze our behavior and determine which habits actually need to be changed. The secondary goal is to increase our motivation by creating a strong contrast between a bad habit we want to change and the benefits of much healthier habits to replace it. In this step, we need to think about the kind of person we want to become. What kind of person would you like to be? Are your current habits and activities leading you there? Are your actions the kind of actions that this kind of person would take? To find out what habits are actually bad for us, it is beneficial to do what is called a cost-benefit analysis. Essentially, it's just making a pros and cons list of different habits. If you are not sure whether a habit is bad, you should objectively weigh the long-term consequences of performing that habit. Epictetus, for example, required his students to imagine and reflect on the consequences of certain actions and how they would affect them in the long run. For example, if we watch 3 to 4 hours of TV series or movies on the couch every evening after work, we should consider what the long-term advantages and disadvantages would be if we continue to pursue this habit. What could we do instead that might lead us closer to our true values and goals in life? And how would that play out in the long run? Likewise, we should consider what it would be like to focus more on things that could bring us more fulfillment and spend less time engaging in the bad habits. Bad habits may seem pleasant in the moment, but what are the long-term consequences if we continue to indulge them? Do they really provide us with long-term value? Or do they only create short-lived satisfaction? We also need to be clear and aware that we really need to have the desire to change. Otherwise, strategies and actions will not bring long-term success. Step 2. Pay attention to your triggers and warning signs. Once we've determined which of our habits we actually want to change, we should actively look for early warning signs. Now comes the part where we go into a kind of introspection and train our stoic mindfulness. Here we will need to analyze our behavior, our actions, our feelings, so that we can begin to identify our triggers. This is where we will look for certain feelings that may occur when we enter a certain place, when we are around a certain person, when a certain emotion comes over us, or when we say we are really stressed about something. As soon as we notice such warning signs, this is the time to make a note of them, whether on a notepad or in our phone. Like a detective, we actively try to track when these things happen and certain desires and cravings arise. We keep a daily written record of when it occurs, where it occurs, why it occurs, how it occurs, and what thoughts arise within us. In this step, the main goal is to get to know ourselves better and learn when and how these bad behaviors and habits occur most often. By becoming more aware of our thoughts, emotions and feelings, 
we begin to gain more control over our reactions to things because we can break the chain of behavior at an early stage. This can help us to better break bad habits. But before we can replace one of our bad habits with a better one, these first two steps are really important because through them we need to practice our self-awareness and mindfulness and we need to know ourselves better. We need to know when and where these things arise in us. Because obviously we can't change anything if we don't even know what's going on. Step 3. Gain Cognitive Distance We learn to recognize, pause and gain distance from the thoughts and value judgments we place on external things. We should come to believe that we need one of the most important psychological practices in Stoicism, namely that we separate our internal values and value judgments from external things and events. Such detached observation of our own feelings and thoughts will help us gain a cognitive distance and soften the need to give in to our desires. Epictetus said, my principal task in life is this, to distinguish between things and establish a division between them and say, external things are not within my power, choice is within my power. Where am I to seek the good and the bad? Within myself, in that which is my own. But with regard to what is not my own, never apply the words good or bad and benefit and harm, and any other word of that kind. It is not things we crave, but our own feelings about those things that make us crave them. We are the ones who voluntarily choose to assign a certain value to all external things in life. We often talk about external things we crave in emotional language that adds to the craving. Oh my god, I'm dying for this chocolate. It just tastes amazing. I want to eat it right now. Or, I absolutely love this TV show. I can't wait to watch the next episode. When we become aware of these thoughts, this is the time to practice mindfulness and realize that placing such a value judgment on something external only encourages the bad habit and makes it worse. We should then build a cognitive distance from these thoughts here. We might say to ourselves, you are just a thought, nothing more, nothing less. We can get cognitive distance just as well with an objective description of reality. The Stoics called this technique Phantasia Cataleptica. Here, we try to describe something with objective and neutral words. Marcus Aurelius described it this way. To acquire indifference to pretty singing, to dancing, to the martial arts, analyze the melody into the notes that form it, and as you hear each one, ask yourself whether you are powerless against that. That should be enough to deter you. The same with dancing individual movements and tableau, and the same with the martial arts, and with everything except virtue and what springs from it. Look at the individual parts and move from analysis to indifference. Apply this to life as a whole. Let's take the example of chocolate. When we realize that we say to ourselves, oh my god, I'm dying for this chocolate, it just tastes fantastic, I want to eat it right now, we can apply this stoic technique by saying to ourselves, it's just chocolate, it's mostly fat, a tiny bit of cocoa, and a very large amount of sugar. You can use this technique for all kinds of things. The smartphone is just a case consisting of plastics, ceramics and metals. When we represent things we strongly desire with objective and non-emotional words, we are much better able to distance ourselves from them internally. Marcus Aurelius applied this technique to food, for example. 
like seeing roasted meat and other dishes in front of you and suddenly realizing this is a dead fish, a dead bird, dead pig, or that this noble vintage is grape juice and the purple robes are sheep wool dyed with shellfish blood. Step 4. Do something different. So far, we've assessed our behavior and figured out which habits we want to change. We've learned how to practice self-awareness and mindfulness to recognize early warning signs or triggers. And we've practiced how to pause and gain cognitive distance from these behaviors. In a perfect world, the next step would be simply to stop acting on these feelings or to take a time out. Many of our cravings only last for a very short time, even though they may come up several times a day. We only ever deal with the urge that is currently arising. We go from craving to craving, so to speak, until the craving subsides on its own. Being able to recognize these feelings and thoughts early on and realizing that it's our own thinking that makes us feel the way we do and not the actual thing itself should really help us get some distance from it and keep us from acting on that craving. This is the time when it is important to replace this bad habit with a new habit that is healthy for us, intrinsically rewarding and gives us real satisfaction so that we no longer become victims of our own intemperance. We usually don't admire someone for being able to eat a lot of fast food or smoke away two packs of cigarettes a day, but rather someone who managed to discipline themselves. The idea is that we replace unfulfilling and unhealthy habits and cravings with activities that give us greater inherent satisfaction. For example, when we get home from work in the evening, we decide to stop watching 4 hours of TV series on the couch and maybe take a long walk with our dog or exercise or read a book on Stoic philosophy. I really recommend this. And maybe only watch half an hour of TV series. We actively choose to do things that not only seem superficially pleasant, but things that are healthier and more beneficial to our lives in the long run. Things that align with our values and our goals in life. We should never forget that we have a freedom of choice and therefore always a choice in what we decide to do. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, subscribe to the channel and more importantly, share the video with someone who can benefit from this content. Thank you and stay inspired.